sounds here. It sounds pretty. for coming. We are in reduced numbers today. Probably it's the Passover. Who knows? Uh, but we're very, very glad to welcome you to the Temple Tiferet Israel. And I am Katya Oisherman. I am the director of the museum here, the Temple Museum of Jewish Art, Religion, and Culture. And I uh, uh, took over from the extraordinary Sukoletsky here, uh, who is really also to blame, so to speak, for the uh, current uh, situation and the current way, in the current way, uh, event in a way. So, uh, so before we will, uh, we will proceed to the, uh, to the actual talk, 
uh, I just want to remind uh, us about a few basic things. So if you need a restroom, it is on the left-hand side once you uh, exited the chapel. Um, basic things that have to do with the materials that are on exhibit here. So most of it comes from uh, the Temple Museum collection and the Temple Library. Some of it, Irwin was very gracious and brought also uh, materials from his own uh, private uh, collection. So some of them are untouchable. They are clearly labeled. So the magazines on that table here and the 1939 vellum Haggadah that is on the stand there cannot be touched. So once we will be over with the talk and with the Q&A, uh, I will stand by the book and I will turn the pages for you. So we just really want that extraordinary volume to live as long as possible and to be available for as many people as possible throughout generation, what we call midor le do. So that's the, uh, uh, the kind of stringent touch policy. Um, so it is very important to mention that the current event would not be possible without very generous uh, contribution from Marsha Weiser here. Marsha, thank you so much. Marsha is not a member of our congregation, but her children are, and she is a very long time uh, fan of Erwin Unger here. Uh, and uh, another very important contribution comes from the Maisel Family Artistic Fund that is the Maisel family are very long time supporters of the Temple Museum. Uh, even more so, the uh, uh, paintings of the three heroes, the basically the original ideation for the Jig uh, windows in the uh, entrance to this chapel uh, were also added to our collection, uh, collection thanks to the generosity of the Maisel Art Fund. So uh, we're really uh, dearly indebted to, to, to their contribution. Um, so um, what else? Uh, so let's just re let me just remind you that tomorrow, 4 p.m., we will have the next stage of the uh, program today. So we will have the tour of the windows here at the chapel. So all of you, of course, are invited and bring other people. Um, so uh, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Uh, uh, is the tour of the windows. Uh, another thing that I would like to uh, remind uh, all of us is that uh, the museum is really active. And if you haven't been to the Maltz, if you haven't seen our Judaica gallery at the Maltz Museum, which is just literally two minutes walk from here, please do so. And it's, it's a really, really beautiful uh, exhibit uh, from which we actually managed to uh, extract today the most important original edition of the Zhik Haggadah. So uh, it will return to its uh, lawful location uh, at the mouth. Um, also, uh, next week, uh, the new exhibition here at this building, which is called From Israel Now, which is dedicated to contemporary Israeli art that is reflective of the events of October 7, uh, will be open to the public. You're most welcome to attend, and I will be giving tours so uh, you can follow us online, and if you want to, uh, to come and see it, you are most welcome to do so. Um, so, yes, I think I covered it all, so again, just to, uh, to make sure that you know that the Temple Library and the Temple Museum are really two quite extraordinary institutions. We're always here, we're always happy for people to come and visit us. So just keep that in mind. So today, uh, 
uh, we are going to listen to Irwin Unger uh, talking about the Zhik Haggadah. And Irwin Unger is a former pulpit rabbi and antiquarian bookseller, and he devoted the past quarter century to scholarship on Arthur Zhik. He has curated and consulted for number, numerous Zhik exhibitions, including the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco, the Deutsche Historical Museum in Berlin, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Library of Congress, and the New York Historical Society. Unger is the author of Arthur Zhik, Soldier in Art. You can see that book up in their table. Uh, and co-producer of the documentary film, Soldier in Art, Arthur Zhik, and the creator and publisher of the luxury limited edition of the Zhik Haggadah. His most recent book, Arthur Zhik, Preserved Institutional Collections of Original Art, also there on the table, uh, was published in spring 2023. He has also served as the curator of the Arthur Rick Society in Burlingame, California, and his memoirs on his life with Arthur Rick have been accepted by a major university press and will be forthcoming. So without further ado. Okay, thank you, Katya. Okay. All right. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Katya and, and uh, Sue, where are you? Sue, where are you? There you are. Sue, thank you for all you've done to lead up to this moment and all the years of faithful service uh, to the synagogue and to its museum and uh, appreciate all that you've done to help facilitate uh, Schick's presence here uh, in, in the Cleveland community. And uh, thank you again, Katya, for uh, making it possible for me to be here, Marcia, and all, everything that you've done and your family to, uh, to make it possible for me to, uh, uh, to speak to you about Arthur Schick and the art of the Haggadah. Uh, welcome to Arthur Schick's world. The introductory, I'm gonna jump right in, the introductory uh, vignette before you of European Jews clustered in chains together with the pyramids of ancient Egypt provides a window into the artist's moving of history and transporting of time and place. This image demonstrates how Schick uses a traditional text, in this case the Haggadah narrative, to provide a visual commentary on contemporary events that were unfolding in Europe at the time that he created the Haggadah, which he partially witnessed and fully envisioned in 1930s Poland and Europe on the eve of the Holocaust. This presentation will focus on the specific themes that are emphasized by Schick within the context of the Haggadah, drawing particular attention to his activist nature and his call for a response by his Jewish brothers and sisters to the tragedy that was unfolding before them in Nazi-occupied Europe and to an unprepared world which was virtually silent to their plight. The Haggadah tells the story of the exodus from Egypt. Who brought the Israelites out? Not Moses. How they were brought out? Not by Moses. And why they were brought out? The exodus is the seminal event in Jewish history and remembered in daily prayers and every Friday evening when Jews say the Kiddush with the word Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim as a reminder of the exodus from Egypt. And so why did Jews need to be routinely reminded of freedom? Why do all of us, Jews and non-Jews, need to be summoned? Because that right is not given. It must be constantly protected and safeguarded. One must be vigilant in its defense, and this is Arthur Schick. Passover, for him, is the great story of freedom, of freedom from degradation and shame, from bondage and oppression, and it is the obligation of every Jew to tell that story to the next generation. And that story can be told with either a Maxwell House Haggadah or the Schick Haggadah, or the more than 5,000 editions in between. I would like to think that Arthur Schick's Haggadah, as will become apparent, rises to the very heights of capturing the essence of the Jewish past, the story of its then tragic present, and the need to rigorously be diligent to physically ensure a Jewish future. 
Given the present in which we find ourselves, the manner in which Schick illuminates the Haggadah narrative takes on particular significance for this coming Passover. I know the slide is blank. Now to the context of the creation of Schick's Haggadah. In 1933, Hitler came to power. The government of the United States in that year invited Arthur Schick to come to the United States. One Jew from Poland in the year Hitler came to power was invited to come to the United States. Why? To exhibit his works on freedom at the Library of Congress. And when Schick arrived in December of 1933 on a cold and snowy day in New York, photographers were there photographing him and his wife. An exhibition of his art was already taking place at the Brooklyn Museum, and then in 34, transferred to the Library of Congress. These were the works that were being featured Wash paintings, 38 paintings from his series of Washington and his Times, which highlighted the theme of freedom, that is, during the Revolutionary War. And these paintings hung in the White House. 38 paintings of Schick were hanging in the White House when Franklin Roosevelt delivered his famous Four Freedoms speech in January of 1931. So if every, anyone ever asks you whose art on freedom was there when Roosevelt gave that speech, it was 38 paintings of Arthur Schick of, from Washington and his times, of which you're seeing one of the images on the left. The other body of work that was exhibited in the, white, in the, in the Library of Congress was his Statutes of Kalish, a, 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 a over 45 paintings, drawings, that featured the freedom that was given to the Jews in the 13th century by Boleslav the Pious, and Schick again was emphasizing freedom, and that's why he was invited, uh, invited to come to America to the Library of Congress to exhibit his works as an artist for freedom. In 1934, the Library, Congress of the United States, in recognition of these exhibitions and Schick's advocacy for freedom on behalf of humanity, he was presented with the George Washington Bicentennial Medal, again, by the United States Congress, after he had already been decorated by the governments of Poland and France. France, in 1921, granting Schick the Palm Académique, and the Polish government decorating him in 1931 with the Gold uh, Cross of, of Merit, which was the highest honor that could be a, on, uh, given to Polish citizens. These awards for his works in the service of mankind. With his third medal in hand, that is that from the United States Congress, after seven months in the United States, Arthur Schick returned to Poland, that's in 1934, into his hometown of Ludge, and he began to illustrate that great book of freedom in Jewish tradition, the Haggadah. Between 1934 and 1936, he illuminated 48 manuscript leaves, including the calligraphy, miniature watercolor and gouache paintings on paper, for context, please keep in mind that Germany's racist Nuremberg laws were passed in 1935 at the time that Schick was working on this great book of freedom. In 1937, armed with the portfolio of his response to the Nazi threat to his people and the retelling and contemporizing of an ancient narrative, he carried those manuscript leaves with him, that is the original art he took with him to London, where over the next three years, he would supervise the printing of the Haggadah. And while working on the Haggadah's publication process, Schick would write in 1938 to his English translator, the renowned Oxford scholar Cecil Roth. And he would write to him, in a letter, the Haggadah is the work of my life. I have sacrificed many years of my work as well as my, all of my fortune, which has been very small during the war in order to do it. I've even contracted debts in order to complete it. In 1940, almost overshadowed shadowed by the bombs that were falling on London, that is during the Battle of Britain, Schick's Haggadah was being published 
Can you imagine this? Gathering the vellum skins that had to be brought in, and they're working at the printers to get this Haggadah out, and, and the finest of vellum skins, in an addition of 250 copies, one of which is to my right in the center of this table, in an elegant binding by the prestigious bookbinder Sangorsky and Sutcliffe, and in the midst of the, the, the publication, actually in the introduction to this, Cecil Roth had wrote to call Arthur Schick the greatest illuminator since the 16th century is no flattery. It is the simple truth that manifests itself to anyone who studies his work with the care which it deserves. Similarly, the Times of London compared Schick's Haggadah to the masterpieces of the Middle Ages, stating that it is worthy to be placed among the most beautiful of books that the hand of man has produced. And at $500 per copy, it was the most expensive new book in the world in 1940. This book by the Polish Jew in London the most expensive new book in the entire world. In 1940, you could buy a house on a street, something in many cities in the United States, for what you would pay for Schick's Haggadah at that time. The publisher was the Beaconsfield Press, a cooperative consisting of Jews from Lvov, who together with a few wealthy British Jews put up the money to publish only one book, the Haggadah. They called it the Beaconsfield Press, hoping that they might capitalize on the name of the Earl of Beaconsfield, Benjamin Disraeli, a born Jew, Queen Victoria's man of the people, who was twice Prime Minister of Great Britain. In 1956, five years after Schick died, the first popular trade edition of his Haggadah was published in Israel. And here it is to my right. It has a vellum cover. Ten thousand copies of this book were published in 1956. Another ten thousand were published in 1957, and they continued publishing it in the 1960s, 1980s, 1990s through 2000, and sometimes with metal covers, all different kinds of metal covers, not silver plate, metal covers in different sizes, smaller, larger, and these were printed uh, in Israel throughout this period of time. In 2008. I published a new edition of the Shik Haggadah in premier and deluxe editions with a new translation and commentary by Rabbi Byron Sherwin, a prominent scholar from Chicago affiliated with the Spurtis Institute. I followed this by creating a popular trade edition in soft cover uh, with Abrams Books in 2011. This is the history of the printing of the Shik Haggadah, which I've now summarized, and I'd like to turn now to the art itself and to start by explicating, by explaining to you one page within the Haggadah. There'll be more, but I want to go into one in detail to set the stage for what's to unfold in the pages um, that follow. Where he, this, this page is a dedication to King George VI. Um, and we should look at this and try to understand why this is, serves as the dedication page for the Haggadah. For the Haggadah. But first, a question. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people here saw the movie, uh, I don't know, it was about 13, 12, 13 years ago, called The King's Speech with Colin Firth? Okay, most of you. That's about King George VI. That's the king to whom, to whom Schick dedicated this, this Haggadah. And the question is, and... and he ascended the throne in December of 1936, which was when Schick had just was finishing the Haggadah, working on it from 1934 to 1936. The illuminated uh, text of this Haggadah reads, at the feet of your most gracious majesty, I humbly lay these works of my hands, shewing forth the afflictions of my people Israel. Arthur Schick. Illuminator of Poland. Why did Schick decide to dedicate this great book of freedom to the newly proclaimed British monarch in 1936? For, he had two reasons. First, 
because Schick planned to leave Poland at the end of that year for England to supervise the printing of the Haggadah manuscript as a book, and it made perfect sense, literary sense, to dedicate it to the new king. But second, and more importantly, for political reasons, Schick saw Great Britain as the leading opponent of Nazism in Europe. Remember that America is not in the war for five more years. By dedicating a book that recalls the biblical, uh, Jews' biblical liberation from tyranny to George VI, and then presenting him with the very first copy of the Haggadah, Schick placed upon the king the responsibility to recognize the injustices that were done to the Jewish people in the past and awakening, the, awakening them to their present tragedy. But there's a problem with dedicating the Haggadah to King George VI. And what's the problem? The problem is, after World War I, the League of Nations had granted Great Britain a mandate over the territories of the Ottoman Empire that included Palestine. By 1936, the British government had already enacted its first in a series of white papers. That is, documents designated to restrict the flow and immigration and freedom of Jews to go to their ancestral homeland in Palestine. Knowing this, how could Schick dedicate this book of freedom, celebrating freedom, to the head of a government that restricted the freedom of his people, that would keep them virtually trapped in Europe with no way to escape the grasp of the Nazi vulture to, safe, to, to safety in the land of Israel? How could he be both intellectually and emotionally honest in confronting this dilemma as, as an artist for freedom? And herein lies the, an example of the great genius of Arthur Schick. And you'll notice here, at the bottom right of the dedication page, he painted a modern exodus of European Jews who are in transit. These are European Jews. Remember, this is a book about the exodus of the ancient Israelites from Egypt. But more for Schick, it's about the exodus of European Jews. And he's in the bottom right-hand corner, and in the bottom left-hand corner, on the gates entering into Palestine, there's the Hebrew word Zion, Zion. And between the Jews, who want to have an exodus from Egypt on the bottom right, who want to enter into Zion, into Zion on the bottom left, in the very center, Schick paints a British military ship that stands between the freedom of Jews from Europe and entering into safety into the land of Israel. The Haggadah is a religious text, but for Arthur Schick, it's a, pract it's a political book about justice and about freedom. His visual narrative speaks truth to power and presents a compelling call to action. And as if to emphasize who overtly and dared and boldly dared to put forth this call, Schick painted his own portrait on the dedication page. We see him standing by his people, pallet in hand, dressed in quasi-military garb as a soldier in art, fighting on their behalf, an illuminator of Poland. And again, the first copy was presented to the King of England. I shall now point out the themes which Schick repeatedly emphasizes in his Haggadah, after which I will turn to individual images which support those themes. So first of all, the themes in his Haggadah. First and foremost, it is clear that Schick sees the Nazis as the new Egyptians who have come to annihilate his people. Secondly, he emphasizes that the response of his people must be heroism, not victimhood. Thirdly, Schick clearly calls attention to hatred and anti-Semitism of varying kinds directed against the Jewish people throughout history and unequivocally and militantly advocates for the destruction of the eternal enemy of the people of Israel namely the blotting out of the biblical Amalek and its evil descendants. Fourth, Schick emphasizes the role of Moses and David 
in his Haggadah. Fifth, Schick places strong attention on Zionism motifs. The idea that in the 1930s, Jews should leave Europe and go to the land of Israel. Sixth, his portrayal of the four sons is entirely unique, and not only within the Haggadah, but within the whole of Jewish art. And his parable that derives from those four sons following the war is equally powerful and poignant. And finally, attention will be paid to the five dedication pages which Schick completed for the Haggadah, only two of which were included in the 1940 publication. Okay, and now to the, uh, to the multitude of images uh, to support these themes the, and the first of Schick's themes, which is Hitler as the new Pharaoh and the Nazis as the new Egyptians. Schick began attacking Hitler in his art as early as 1933, during his early commuting days between uh, Poland and London. Here, one sees Hitler as a Pharaoh and with his attendant, Hermann Goering, who oversaw the creation of the Gestapo and was one of the most powerful figures in the Nazi party. Both are dressed in Egyptian garb. This image did not appear in the Haggadah, nor was it drawn for the Haggadah. It was a sketch never completed, but it's proof of how Schick saw the intent of the Nazi Fuhrer as a ruler bent upon the destruction of the people of Israel and how he associated him with the Passover narrative. Keep in mind, this is 1933. Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Here we see an Egyptian taskmaster in the upper right corner with Aryan blonde hair and blue eyes forcing Hebrew slaves, the people of one God, who are wearing yarmulkes, to chisel away and paint Egyptian gods, an ultimate act of humiliation, while in the vignette below, Pharaoh sits on his throne. I want to call to your attention the circular yellow and red rondel in the center of the chest of the Egyptian, again in the upper right. It was here and elsewhere in his Haggadah that Schick painted swastikas as a means of identifying the new taskmasters as Nazis. Those same rondels appear on the armbands and the chests of other Egyptians as well. But Schick painted over them prior to publication. In the printed Haggadah, in any of the editions of the printed Haggadah, including the 1940 edition, the swastikas are nowhere to be seen, likely as a result of the publisher's censorship and persuasion of Schick to remove them, lest the Haggadah might never see the light of day because, as, I, as perhaps I can say it, because of political correctness of the day. But I could only imagine how Schick must have thought but how do we even know that the swastikas were there in the first place if you can't see them, neither on the, in the printed book nor on the printed art itself? In 2002, in preparation for the Schick exhibition at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in the exhibition The Art and Politics of Arthur Schick, I suggested to the museum to look for the swastikas on several of the Haggadah pieces which were loaned. We were slaves, Avadim Hayinu was one of the pieces. Now how did I know to tell them to look for the swastikas? Because several years before, I met a man in his late 80s, Mr. Horowitz in Tel Aviv, who told me that when he was a boy in, in Lvov, which is uh, several hundred miles from Ludge, Schick's home, heading eastward, that Schick visited his father's home sometime in 1935 and 1936 to show the senior Horowitz, a sponsor of the Haggadah's publication later in London. He wanted to show him the Haggadah art that he had completed. Young Horowitz 
came down the steps in the middle of the night. Men were gathered around his father's table, dining room table, examining the Shikhagat art, and squeezing between them, he saw swastikas on the original art on the Egyptians. He saw the swastikas on snakes, and he saw them on the arm of the wicked son in the Haggadah. All were eventually painted over or removed, as I indicated. But prior to the museum opening in 2002, through special magnification and with equipment able to see beneath layers of paint, the swastikas were indeed there. Mr. Horowitz was right. And I hope you can see the black background on the swastika within the rondel. And so too, swastikas appeared initially on one of the most beautiful of Schick images in the four questions. While the father or grandfather listens to the son or grandson read from the Haggadah within the large initial mem of the Hebrew word of ma, of ma nishtana, why is this night different from all other nights? And while we ourselves contemplate why is this Passover different from all other Passovers, we see within the mem smallish vignettes in the bottom, Egyptians are drowning in the sea, and up here we see baby Moses, and over, over to the far right, we see the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. But above them, in the upper right hand, in the upper right hand corner, a snake lurks, ready to attack the earliest freedom marchers. And on the snake's back are indeed swastikas as seen on this lithograph printed in 1935, which I discovered among my Schick archives and shows the swastikas on the serpent before they were painted over on the original art prior to the 1940 publication. And indeed, Mr. Horowitz was right again. And I hope you can see that these are swastikas that are all along the back of the stake, whereas on the print on the original art itself, we do not see swastikas. This is beneath the layers of paint. Schick's four sons. Here are Schick's four sons, the, the wise, the wicked, the simple, the one who does not know how to ask. These are four adult men, four types of people, but for the rabbis and for Schick, these were clearly four Jews. It is the wicked son in the upper left upon whom I wish to focus. In almost all illustrated Haggadot uh, printed prior to the 20th century and those that weren't printed but illuminated manuscripts, the wicked son, when illustrated, was primarily portrayed as a soldier, an enemy of the Jewish people. His outward appearance and actions here evidence hatred. In Schick's case, this wicked son is seen as a Jew clothed in the garb of self-hatred. A German Jew, the others are Polish Jews, a German Jew with riding boots, a crop, a feathered hat, a cigarette, and a Hitler-like mustache. And on this wicked son, Schick once had painted a swastika, probably as an armband. But this is the image that we have in the Haggadah. But how do we know that a swastika was once there? The clue here again comes from the original art itself, where we see the verso, that is the back of the paper on which Schick painted the four sons, paper that was left over from one of his earlier projects. In the upper right-hand corner, that quadrant was cut out. The first wicked son was replaced with the one that we see now. And if we flip over the sheet, we can see that that quadrant with remnants of old tape and new to put the image in that's now, we would this quadrant, if it was flipped over, would land in the upper left-hand corner, indeed the portion upon which the original wicked son was once painted. 
and Mr. Horowitz was right for the third time. The question remains, how could Schick paint a swastika on a Jew? And how could he call a fellow Jew a Nazi, particularly at a time when Hitler was in power? The fact is that when Schick painted this image in 1934, there were Jews who indeed supported the National Socialists and their economic policies. And to Arthur Schick, they would have been as if they too were Nazis. Ancient Jewish warriors, this is the second theme emphasized in Schick's Haggadah. Response, heroism, not victimhood, symbolized by the numerous Jewish fighters and warriors. We see them in the dedication page to King George, a helmeted soldier with a seven-branched menorah atop. We see them in a warrior associated with the bread of affliction, which our ancestors ate in Egypt. They are present in the first battle with Amalek, a wilderness people with whom the Israelites fought after crossing the Sea of Reeds, Israel's first enemy on its path to freedom. And in the great Hallel, a, a psalm of praise, we see Shik's hero, a warrior. And in the context of the song of Echad Miodea, who knows one. And in the songs of Haggad Yah and Dayenu, the young David is shown twice with the head of Goliath. Note that on the left, Goliath has blonde hair and blue eyes, Shik portraying him as, a, as an Aryan to be dealt with. What does David have to do with the Haggadah and the Passover narrative? Absolutely nothing. But for Schick, everything, as he represents heroism and the need to stand up to the powerful enemy. It was images such as these with which Schick hoped to inspire and to uplift his people in mid to late 1930s Europe. And two last and unlikely presentations of heroic figures. First, the prophet Elijah. Here we see the beautiful cup of Elijah, but Schick departs from emphasizing the ceremonial traditional visit by Elijah to every Jewish Passover Seder and his bringing of blessings, and instead he chooses to call attention to Elijah's heroic act of confronting and rebuking the evil king Ahab on Mount Carmel. And here, the prophet Samuel puts Agog, the king of the Amalekites, to death before the Lord at Gilgal. We transition here from the heroes of ancient Israel, as Shik sees them, to the eternal enemies of the Jewish people embodied by Amalek. And to do so, it is essential first to highlight Shik's illumination of the Haggadah text. In every generation, they stand against us to annihilate us. Bechol dor vador omdim aleinu lechalotenu. Many of the various nations throughout history who attempted to annihilate the Jewish people are pictured within this single image by Shik. The Assyrian king is here, represented by the mask in the lower left. The wheel of the Roman chariot is in the bottom right. A Roman eagle standard is enlarged in the detail. And if you can't find them all as I'm speaking so rapidly, they are there and the page requires study. So you all take out your shikagadas when you're at home for Passover and you'll take a look and you'll see every one of those that I'm emphasizing. And I assume that everyone here and everyone who is listening to me will be having their Passover Seder with a shik hagada. But every one of these images, the Romans, the Roman eagle standard, which is enlarged in the detail, bears the famous Latin abbreviation, S-P-Q-U-A-R, the Senatus Populus Romanus, the Senate and the Roman people. The medieval shield, which is yellow and red, with the emblems of the Spanish kings of Castile and Leon, which represents the Spanish Inquisition. The pinkish helmet, 
bears the Hebrew word Haman, signifying the biblical story of Esther and Mordecai's triumph over Haman's evil plot to destroy the Jews. The imperial double-headed eagle of Tsarist Russia, recalling the pogroms, is here. And the cannons in the top right as symbols of a particular war or all wars. All while the Jew at the top has survived these acts of genocide and can raise the cup in celebration of life. This scene brings to my mind the words of Mark Twain, who in his short 1899 essay concerning the Jews for Harper's Magazine wrote the following. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose they filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed, and they made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Perhaps, Mr. Twain, Mr. Schick's response might be, it is the Jews' stubborn attempt and their insistence to adhere to a divine moral law and its intellectual challenge as represented by the Ten Commandments, which are seen in the upper right, which preside over this image that offer a clue to their survival. Now to Amalek, the eternal enemy of the Jewish people. The teacher instructs his students, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven. Do not forget. On the bottom of Elijah's cup, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek. In the bottom center text, the Lord will be at war with Amalek in every generation. And here, in Modern Moses, a work on the right, a work of art distributed by the Emergency Committee to Save the Jewish People of Europe, for which Schick served as one of its vice presidents, Aaron, a man of peace, is replaced by a Jewish soldier, and Hur, the nephew warrior of Moses, is replaced by a resistance fighter to fight the modern Amalek of 1940s Europe. And now Schick's emphasis on the scales of justice. A leading nation is a Malik, but its fate is to perish forever. A Malik will be judged as evidenced by the scales of justice. As will King Belshazzar, who desecrated the vessels in the Holy Temple, according to the biblical book of Daniel, the Hebrew writing on the wall indicating that he will die and scales of justice in Haggadah. And Judith meted out punishment to the invading Assyrian general, Holofernes, killing him with, with his own sword. Again, justice as symbolized by the scales. And again, an enemy of ancient Israel is identified by Shik with a swastika on the pummel of the sword. Perhaps difficult to see on this slide, but it is there, again painted over in the Haggadah, but an earlier print of this exists showing the swastika. And now, moving to David and Moses. For Schick's Haggadah, justice and retribution will ultimately prevail. He sees Jewish militancy and activism of which David and Moses are paradigmatic models as the primary vehicles for meeting out justice to the foes of the people of Israel. 
and first Moses. There are three versions here of Moses strikes the Egyptian. The far right image appeared in the Haggadah. The center image was painted in 1933, before Schick worked on all of the images which are found in the printed Haggadah. The far left painting was done in Paris in the mid-1920s. Remember, Schick worked on his Haggadah from 1934 to 1936. The image on the far left is from the mid-1920s when Schick began to illustrate his first Haggadah, which was never published. And though it was completed, the idea of printing it was abandoned for an unknown reason at the end of the 1920s. I once owned original art from that Haggadah, and in Schick's 1927 diary, he wrote about completing his first Haggadah. We return to this image, shown earlier, but I emphasize here Moses standing before Pharaoh in the bottom vignette. But there's a problem with this image. What is the problem? Schick knows that in the biblical narrative, it was not Moses who stood before the Egyptian ruler, but it was Aaron. How do we know this in the first place? Well, it is Moses. How do we know this is Moses standing before Pharaoh and not Aaron? Because next to Moses is Pharaoh, who is wearing the breastplate of the 12 tribes and stands to his right. So why then has Schick painted Moses in this fashion front and center before Pharaoh? The answer, to elevate the status of Moses to the Haggadah reader. And as many of you know, Moses' name is not mentioned in the Haggadah text at all. There is a piyut that does make reference to his name, but in the body of the text, we don't find Moses' name. Is Schick the only artist or any commentator to include Moses, uh, put Moses back into the Haggadah narrative? No. But to do it so dramatically, not as a religious figure, not who, but as a military figure. And here we see, uh, here we see three Exodus images the far right painting appearing in the Haggadah. The center image was painted in 1933 along with that other 1933 image I showed you which were the only two images painted in 1933. And the image on the far left was painted in the 1920s. And this earliest image, the one on the far left, does not have Moses presiding over the Exodus as in the two later images on the, the middle and the one on the far right. Again, emphasizing the theme of Moses. Moses stands atop in the upper right as the enemies of Israel perish. And this final slide of Moses. We return to this once again, but we focus here now on Moses, who has a bare chest covered but in part by his white beard, as a, almost as if he's a bodybuilder and had trained under the once popular fitness guru of Jack LaLanne. He's shown here as a military leader with his arms raised as the Israelites are victorious in battle. Schick clearly has chosen, as we have seen throughout the Haggadah, to emphasize that men and women must become involved in the physical redemption of their brothers and sisters. And where the rabbis removed Moses from the Haggadah and placed redemption totally in God's hands, Schick chose, as I mentioned earlier, to reinstate Moses in the Passover narrative, but rather than emphasize Moses' role as a religious leader, Schick portrays him first and foremost as a military figure who's to be emulated by the Jews of Europe. And this explanation is courtesy of my friend Rabbi Byron Sherwin. And now to David in the Haggadah. Two images of the young David, and here an elegant King David is shown in the Haggadah tailpiece. Below David are the words recited as one completes the reading of one of the five books of Moses in the Torah scroll at the synagogue. Chazak, chazak, venit chazak. Be strong, be strong, and may you be strengthened. And Chick chooses the words from Psalms 53, 7 to inscribe on the tablet held by David. 
Oh, that the deliverance of Israel might come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortune of his people, Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be glad. And what is wrong with this image? It should be the Egyptians in the chariot chasing the Israelites. But rather, it is the Hebrews in the chariots running down their enemies. How so? Notice the star of David on the chariot above the wheel and the blue and white banner, both symbols of the Jewish people. The eagle of Rome or Nazi Germany hovers over the fallen enemy, which is below on the bottom left, below the white steed, while the dove of peace is associated with King David in the chariot, author of the psalm in Hebrew at the very bottom that accompanies this image. Ready the spear and the javelin against my pursuers and tell me that I am your deliverance. Schick again moves history in a way to emphasize the pride of victory for his people driven by its heroic leaders. And now to Zionism motifs throughout the Haggadah. The word Sion, Zion, first appears on this page, as we pointed out before, on the bottom left. And here, an elderly man blesses his family as they head off as pioneers to the land of Israel. Sion is within the context of the Star of David and the Hebrew text of the Shehechianu prayer. Shik encouraging Jews to leave Europe for new life in Sion, in Palestine, inscribed, again, within the Star of David. Matzah. Matzah is both the bread of affliction and the bread of freedom. In the bottom left, we see two Israelites in chains working for the Egyptian taskmasters, symbolizing affliction. The bottom right, two Jews are going off to the land of Israel as free men to be their own taskmasters working for themselves and to emphasize their character as the new Jew who will pioneer and secure the land, Schick paints a tattoo, a Star of David, on the forearm of one of the two secular Jewish workers, on the bottom right, who will carry off a macho spirit to the new land. In contrast here, we see a religious Jew who sows, sows the land. And to conclude the Zionism motifs, Again, the blue and white banner, which were to become the colors of the flag of Israel. And now, to the four sons. One final look at Shik's four sons, which are painted in the Haggadah twice, but with a focus this time at the parable that derives from them. Much like today, where there are different attitudes among American Jews toward the state of Israel. As the war ended in 1945, Schick illustrated the different opinions toward the creation of the state of Israel through the parable of the four sons. Serving as vice chairman of Peter Bergson's American League for a Free Palestine, Schick strongly ad advocated for Jewish statehood. I'm gonna go back. All of these American Jews have a distinctly different disposition. The wicked son asks in 1945, the wicked son, what is this nonsense about a Hebrew nation and an independent homeland? When all this fuss blows over, when the war is well behind, let them, the survivors, return to the countries they came from. From the democ so the democracies, the democracies will see to it that they are safe again and free to worship as other peoples are everywhere. The wicked son. The indifferent and the uninformed sons need to be educated about the meaning of the land of Israel to the Jewish people and that this land is precisely the haven that European Jews require despite the restrictions imposed by its British overlords. 
And the wise son, the helmeted GI, asks in 1945, as a free citizen of the United States, sworn to support the principles of freedom and democracy through peace and in a succession of wars from 1776 to the present day, I want to know how I can help my fellow men of Europe and Palestine to survive and be free. How could I help to stamp out this ceaseless persecution and banish for good the hideous specter of anti-Semitism? And these are all the words from the booklet that was published by the American League for a Free Palestine in 1945. These questions and others were already at the forefront of Arthur Schick's mind on the eve of the printing of his Haggadah in 1940. And finally, there is a finally, and finally the dedication pages. We have fully explored this dedication page to the British king, except for one important note. Schick had three additional words that he had included in the Haggadah dedication. Those three words that were once there are the three words of unaddressed and unavenged, words which were removed prior to the Haggadah's printing. Schick, again, self-censoring himself by painting over them with the three horizontal decorative bars that are below the text. Whether Schick was under pressure from his editor or his publisher, we will never know. But these words initially appeared at the end of the dedication, which would have originally read, at the feet of your most gracious majesty, I humbly lay these works of my hands, showing forth the afflictions of my people Israel, unaddressed and unavenged. The dedication page to the Jews of Germany and Austria was created by Schick after the Anschluss and the annexation of Austria and Kristallnacht in 1938. The Hebrew text reads, this Haggadah, all by Schick, this Haggadah is presented to our brothers, the Jewish people of Germany and Austria, who were persecuted because of their race and their faith and who gave their lives for the sanctification of God's name. These words, like those of the dedication to George VI, were Schick's words. And similarly, in the dedication page to the Jews of Germany in September 1939, shortly after the war broke out that month, Schick began, to the memory of my brethren in Germany in the 57th century, I am dedicating these pictures. The 57th century refers to the Jewish calendar year of 5,700, which began on September 14th, 1939. Poland was invaded on September 1st, 1939. Almost one year after Kristallnacht, this dedication, and two weeks after Germany invaded Poland. Both of these dedications were never included in the printed Haggadah. But Schick also created another dedication page as well. And oh, by the way, on the dedication page on the far left, you see another self-portrait of Arthur Schick in uh, quasi-military garb as a soldier in art. Here he's wearing the three medals that were presented to him by France and Poland and by the United States. He's wearing them on his chest. Here in this dedication page, a third dedication page which was not included in the Haggadah, this is the Lvov dedication page. And the Polish and Yiddish text reads, wanting to pay tribute to my ancestral homeland, the residence of my forefathers, I dedicate with great devotion and affection this particular Haggadah. And in honor of the notables of the city of Lemberg who are stimulated by my work, I am calling this book the Lemberger Haggadah, the German name for Lvov, now called Lviv. Schick remained forever devoted to the country of his birth and the Jews, like Mr. Horowitz, who supported his work there. 
This dedication page, as I mentioned, did not appear in the 1940 printed Haggadah, but I did discover there is one printed vellum edition that has this dedication page uh, in it. And one last dedication page of the last section of this presentation. This appears at the end of the Haggadah. The text, of course, is in French. And this is how Schick concludes his body of work and his magnum opus by saying that I am but a Jew praying in art. If I have succeeded in any measure, if I've gained the power of reception among the elite of the world, then I owe it all to the teachings, the traditions, and the eternal virtues of my people. And in the red medallion, it's hard to read it from there, he signs his name, Imagé de Israel, Arthur Schick, painter of Israel. In contrast to the beginning dedication page where he signed it, Illuminator of Poland. My final slide now presents side by side the first page of Schick's Haggadah with the last page of his Haggadah, which is his frontispiece alongside the French dedication page. Why have I presented these two pages together? Because I wish to emphasize the very element which pervaded his Haggadah from beginning to end. Schick's great love for the Jewish people and its eternal physical and spiritual capital of Jerusalem. If we look at the frontispiece, at the very top of his first leaf, at the first sentence in his Haggadah, we see the Hebrew words of the psalmist, Im Yerushalayim, tishkach yumini. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. And if we then look at the last leaf of his Haggadah, and the last sentence, again, im eshkachech Yerushalayim tishkach yimini, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Shik, the artist, whose Haggadah was the work of his life, could not live without his right hand. Shik, the man, could not live without Jerusalem and the love of his people at the heart of his soul. And to illustrate this very last point, not with another slide, I'd like to conclude my presentation with a short story about a man in a long black coat with the blackest black hat and the longest black beard as if to emphasize that with which my lecture began about the great man, Arthur Schick. In February of 2009, I traveled to Jerusalem because I wanted to showcase my then recently published edition of the Schick Haggadah, which is on the very end of that table. And I wanted to introduce in Israel, essentially, Arthur Schick and his Haggadah to a new generation uh, of Israelis and thought the best way to do that would be through his Haggadah. At this very crowded book fair, this man walked up to me and he walked up to the glass showcase, all in his, in black, at the front of my booth, and he said to me, in perfect English, this is the Haggadah of Arthur Schick correct? As I learned later, he was from an anti-Zionist sect, Toldos Aharon. I was not only astonished that this man spoke to me, and then he spoke in perfect English without a Yiddish accent, but he, that he recognized the Haggadah. And then he stepped closer and he said to me, may I tell you something? And I said, yes, of, of course. I know that Arthur Schick was not a religious man, but every time I look at the calligraphy in his Haggadah, I know 
that he was a man with a deep Jewish soul. It was worth my trip to Jerusalem that February of 2009 to meet one such anonymous religious man and to know that Schick's essence, his heart and his soul, his hand and his art, have the power to not only touch one man who was so very different from him, but to touch so many different kinds of souls throughout the ages. Thank you very much. So, I am happy to take any questions that you have uh, here, and uh, delighted to, uh, to answer them for you. And uh, if you not any questions, I'll ask some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, let me just pass the mic, because so, so that we will have uh, everybody's hearing, and also we were recording, so. Okay. Go ahead. So I have a few questions, actually, but I don't, I want other, other people have a chance, too. But did Arthur Schick ever go to Jerusalem? The answer is that he went to Israel in, um, in 1914 um, with a group of other, uh, a small group of uh, literary people. He left Poland, and he was uh, traveling abroad um, for about half, half a year, and then World War I broke out, and he was conscripted into the to the Russian army, and happily he fled. That's how he survived. But he, he, he uh, did fight at the at the Battle of Woods. And uh, the answer is so. Yes, he was. He did not go later in life after statehood was declared. Um, he had he had several heart attacks. Was not able to go, and he had, he still had other things to do. He had to worry about the creation of the state of Israel, and then then he was not well last few years of his life. But he still was very, very, very productive. And how did he get popular enough to like meet with Roosevelt, you know, beforehand? Like, obviously, you know, he met with you say he met with Roosevelt with Roosevelt or um, in 1933. What's the question? Or, no, he was at the White. Maybe he was at the um, the White House in 1933. How did his art get in the White House? Right. Is that what you're asking? And how? Yes. How did his art? How did his Washington and, so, and his Time series? 38 paintings celebrating George Washington and the American Revolution and freedom. How did they end up in the White House? They ended up because the president of Poland was exhibiting a Schick exhibition in Europe in 1935, and he saw these paintings, and he decided that he'd like to give them as a gift to the president of the United States, and he purchased them from Arthur Schick, and they went to Roosevelt in an attempt to create closer relations between Poland and the US as things were stirring up in Europe. And Schick's art was used to serve as a bridge between those two countries. And hence, they were then hung in the Roosevelt White House. And then later in 1941, they were transferred uh, to the uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, Museum and Library in Hyde Park, which is the first you know, presidential library. But that's where they are now. And, but that's how they ended up in the White House. Any more questions? Yes. I'd like to know what was his background? The question is, what was his upbringing? What was his background? Well, here's the, here's the uh, well, first, at age six, there's this myth about this, this, I don't know if it's a myth, but it's about, the stories were circulating about this prodigy in, in Woods. And it was said that at age six, he was already doing drawings of the boxer, rebellion in China at age six. I was a, a, a young Jew in the middle of Poland do those drawings. He's thrown out of school when he's about 10 or 11 uh, years old for participating in, um, in demonstrations against uh, things that were going on in Poland and in Russia at the time. And he's even painting pictures of the czar. And so he's, he's expelled. And where is Schick getting this from? And then the other, where is he? How is he feeling this? Now, you have to remember, Ludge is a very international city. You know, it's got Protestant, it's got uh, German Protestants, it's got Russian Orthodox, it's got Polish Catholics, it's got 
Jews. The Jews are about 30, 33% of the population, but it's a very international city. So there's a lot of information that's flowing through there. Plus, Woods is also at the end of the Chinese uh, trade route. And so there's a lot of people passing by. And his father owns a textile mill, and people are coming to do business. And so there's a lot going on. And this young boy is seeing a lot, hearing a lot, but he's absorbing a lot. Um, how does all this go into his, in him and make up the kind of person he became as an activist? Where is he hearing these stories from about Moses and David? Where does he get his learning? That's my great mystery. That's the great mystery. I don't know where he got his Jewish education. I don't know of any Rebbe that taught him. I don't know of any Jewish school that he attended. How did he learn to write his Hebrew calligraphy? Well, how did he learn to write in Arabic and Chinese as well? In all the languages that he spoke multilingual, which is not so unusual for many people living in Poland at that time, but he wrote in them, he wrote in German, he wrote in Russian, he, he wrote in English, he wrote in French, and uh, was conversant in, he didn't, uh, he did speak German at, at a moment. His, his daughter said to me that he never got off the train to stop in Germany because he hated the Germans so much in its history. But nonetheless, where did he get, get all of his knowledge from? Um, I can tell you that when he was a teenager in 1910, he was born in 1894, so he's 16 years old, um, his father, who would have liked to have seen him go into the textile mill business, was was uh, petitioned, or was, it was, he, he, was, he was open to sending his son Arthur off to a study in a school in, in Paris. And so he went there for three and a half years. Uh, it was in the Academy Julien. You know, there were other famous painters there at the time. Diego Rivera was there, Jacques Lipschitz was there, um, many, many people who became very well known. But uh, records indicate that while he was there for three and a half years in Paris, he went to only um, about a dozen classes. So where did he learn what he learned? Well, he certainly went to the Louvre and the Bibliothèque Nationale and the Cluny, and when he was back in, in, in Warsaw, he went to the Vavo Castle, and he saw the tapestries, and he saw the Renaissance paintings, and he absorbed all of it. You know, it's, as you know, his style's unlike anyone else's. It's, he has integrated the best of Renaissance painting and Polish and Slavic folk art and, and uh, the, the art of the period of George Gross and, and Otto Dix and, and uh, the art of... Uh, of Bezzalo art as well, looking for a type of Jewish art, and all of this combines. But uh, the good part about that is that if you, uh, once you see his art, you're never gonna confuse him with anyone else, he, because he developed his own unique style. As a miniaturist, you should just know that every one of these paintings is about this size. You know, these are miniatures, and they're watercolor and gouache on paper. He didn't paint on, he didn't paint on parchment or he didn't paint on canvas. You, you know, the Haggadah here is in, on vellum. You know, when you do an illuminated manuscript, usually it's on vellum and then you print facsimiles on paper. Schick's original art was on paper and then the Haggadah and 250 copies was printed on vellum. They asked me one question about his background as a child and I'm already talking about the Haggadah on vellum. But nonetheless, where did all of that background come from that helped make up who he was? Um, because during his lifetime, he became, every news, newspaper article didn't say Arthur Schick to appear here, they would say the great Arthur Schick, or Arthur Schick to speak, it was the famous and world-renowned Arthur Schick. And when articles were written about him in magazines, it was the champion of his people, Arthur Schick. This man was famous in his, in his day, which he achieved, and, and uh, hopefully in our own day he will become Famous again. He's back. Yes. Say again, please. Did he have any brothers or sisters? Yes. The answer is he had uh, uh, two brothers. One who went off to Russia, to, and uh, uh, we don't know what happened to him. But he had a second brother who, together with Arthur Schick's mother, uh, after Schick immigrated, um, uh, he went to London in '37 and came to America in 1940. Um, but he had a brother. Um, together with his mother, who were taken from the Ludge Ghetto and uh, murdered in the Helmno Killing Center. So he had one brother, and he, so he lost his brother and his mother um, in Europe. Um, and he had two children, a son, George, who fought for the Free French under de Gaulle, North Africa. And uh, uh, George died young in the 1950s, but his daughter, Alexandra, died not too many years ago, and I was friends with her for over 25 years, 
and uh, she used to uh, come with me to exhibitions in Europe and Poland she traveled with me to Berlin and uh, I love that lady um, very close so uh, that's a little bit about his family life and his early life uh, to help round out the picture of a of the great Arthur Schick. You know, I, I maintain, I don't mind saying it, I'm saying, I've written about it, um, but this is the artist of the Jewish people. This is the artist for the Jewish people. This was the leading artist for the rescue of European Jewry in America. His art appeared everywhere, newspaper, magazine covers, newspapers, constantly um, being repeated. and. And this was the leading anti-Nazi artist in America during World War II. And you can see many of his magazine covers over here from the original magazines. Um, so uh, I'm not bashful about saying these things publicly. It's, not, it's true. It's my opinion. Maybe there's a difference between truth and opinion, but it's certainly my opinion. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. I'm not liable if it's truth or it's opinion, so I'm did, okay. Did, did Arthur Schick meet any, you know, meet any of the other famous uh, illustrators against the Nazis, like Dr. Seuss or anyone else that? You, know, you mean Dr. Seuss? Yeah. So the answer is, it, everyone knew who he was. I mean, every, you know, in Paris in the 20s, he was. I, you know, I once owned his 1927 diary, and in it, every day he talks about going to the cafes at night. Sometimes he went to two cafes. I mean, he. Everyone knew him, and I'm, I don't know, everyone knew him, but he was well known. You know, some of the most expensive books that were illustrated and published in Paris in the 1920s were by Arthur Schick. His post books were incredibly expensive in Paris. People knew him. And so, uh, do we have letters and correspondence between him and other artists? We know other artists that he knew uh, uh, quite well, and we know that. Um, that you know, if uh, Woody Allen were to consult me when he created, did Midnight in Paris, he certainly would have had Arthur Schick uh, intermingling with all the figures of uh, of Paris uh, during that period. But he was uh, well known. I mean, you know, he uh, he and Chagall were in Europe t at the same time in in Paris, and they were in America at the same time, and they were published in, in in at least one book together in Europe and in America. When Arthur Schick, when the Pathways Through the Bible, a popular book used in Sunday schools by Rabbi Mortimer Cohn, the text, uh, Chagall and Schick were being considered for the artwork in it, which ended up being the artwork of, of, of Arthur Schick. So people knew him. They would come to exhibits. Saul Raskin in New York, for example, uh, signed one of Schick's guest books. I had his guest book, so I know who used to attend, and these names come to me more and more. But but he was very well known and. And I'm sure he knew a lot of he knew a lot of important people. You know, the Queen of England, the the President of the United States, the President of Poland. Everybody knew who he was. And he and he, you know, he, he was photographed with Eleanor Roosevelt on several occasions. She wrote about him in her columns. People knew him. They they knew him. I mean, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, it's Arthur Schick's artwork on the cover of Time magazine. You know, it's it's he's he's everywhere. His Anderson's Fairy Tales, which have nothing to do with this talk or political talk, is probably the most reproduced of any illustrated Anderson's Fairy Tales. And he illustrated the classics of Arabian Nights Entertainments and the Canterbury Tales. You, you know, in order to illustrate them, you have to read them. You have to know what they are. He, the, the man, you know, uh, he did like to go to the movies and play poker, and once in a while he came home late, so he didn't write in his, he said that in his, his diary, you know. I woke up late this morning. That's because he was out late. I don't know what he was doing out late, but we'll leave that to the imagination. Uh, question here? Yes. Where in America did he live? Yeah, uh, he, he came to the United States in October of 1940, and then he lived on uh, Upper West Side in the 70s. Yeah, and then he lived in the 60s. Uh, uh, on the, uh, Madison Avenue, just on corner corner of Madison and 60 something Street, and uh, he left New York and moved to New Canaan, Connecticut, in '46, uh, and uh, 
he, he vacationed in the sum, summer at Westport and in New Canaan, and he bought a house there and uh, died in New Canaan, Connecticut uh, in 1951. Uh, 1951. So that's where he lived uh, in the United States. Um, yeah. So um, I think maybe uh, there is... Um, uh, right. Those so, are the questions. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you, really. Really, it was coming. incredible. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Right. So, first of all, there must be some food outside. I do remind you that we cannot bring food here, so you're most welcome to um, uh, to have a snack outside, just not not no, not in here. If anybody wants to take a closer look at the vellum, 1949. Uh, 39 yeah, I will. I just make a correction on that. That, in, if you go to look at many um, library, university library catalogs, they say 1939. Some say 1940. Many say 1940. Some say 1939. Everyone that says 1939 is absolutely wrong. It was published in 1940. And then why do I know that? I know that because the editor and translator Cecil Roth wrote in a bibliographic a, a journal that everyone says 30, 1939. I can tell you that I received my first copy in 1940 on Rosh Hashanah. This book was published in 1940. So uh, to set the record straight, this book was not published in 1939, but 1940. Schick was already uh, in America, he was in America, uh, or en route to America from Canada. Yeah. Right, so in 1940, Vellum edition, uh, we can do that and uh, I can turn the pages for you and we can take a closer look. Yes, Sue. Oh, uh, we, we're running a little bit late, but go ahead. Okay. One last question, then everybody One can. last one. So yes. you probably looked at the Haggadah that we have in our collection. Yes. Is there anything that's different than any of the other Haggadahs? Or yeah. Can you talk a little bit about this Okay, I, I will. One? I'll tell you a little bit. I'll tell you something about it. Yours has a, a special dedication in the front here. Uh, which I'm not going to pick up, but it's it's right here in the front. It, this was specially presented uh, to the synagogue, and there's a um, calligraphy on the um, on this dedication page. Now, it's hard for me to tell you whether or not this calligraphy here is by Arthur Schick or not. I don't I don't know, but it looks like the art is that the decorative bands look like his. But this is dedicated to the. Uh, to the synagogue. This is copy number nine of, um, of 200. There were 125 copies. They were numbered one through 25, 125. They were distributed in London, and there was another one through 125 that were distributed, I mean, in England, and another uh, one through 125 distributed in the United States. This is copy number nine of... Um, I don't know, I, I forgot when I looked, whether it's the US or not, but it, it has a number. That's not unique. Uh, it, what's unique is number nine, uh, but uh, all the copies are numbered and signed by Cecil Roth and by Arthur Schick. Um, so I will tell you, I just want to point out a difference because I spent many years of my life devoted to this. This Haggadah here should not be overlooked. This is the deluxe edition of the Schick Haggadah. Uh, it shouldn't be overlooked, not because I published it, but well, maybe because I published it and created it. But its translation and commentary is different than this. Uh, Cecil Roth's translation and commentary was not uh, for me. That was not why this book, I undertook this project. It is because the colors that were reproduced in all of Arthur Schick's book never lived up to those of the original art, and I thought I would set out to create a Haggadah which the colors would be exactly the same as the original art, and if you'd like to see the original art with this, if you go to my website of Schick.com, you can see a video of the printing of this book and the laying of the original art right next to uh, the printed pages here. It's two minutes, unlike my... Uh, 20-hour lecture today. It's only two minutes, and, and so you can see that, and in the process then it was decided upon new translation and commentary, which more linked together what Schick was attempting to do thematically throughout his Haggadah um, than the Victorian sort of translation of um, 
Roth that didn't touch on some of the translations of Hebrew passages that Chick had in, in the original. For example, the mystical passages uh, Roth never translated. So. But nonetheless, and then there's a companion volume called Understa Freedom Illuminated, Understanding the Shikhagata that accompanies it and can be acquired separately. So thanks a lot, uh, and I will take any more questions now except off camera and uh, privately. So thank you really for coming, appreciate it a lot. Thank you.